Buonasera, buonasera a tutti. Um, passo subito. Good evening, everybody. We're going to have an English session. Here, thanks to the audience for joining us in today's conversation. Thanks to Tito Boeri and the organizers for, for this opportunity. Uh, and thanks to our, our speakers. My name is uh, Mario Macis. I'm an associate professor of economics at Johns Hopkins uh, University. It's my great pleasure to be uh, uh, moderating this uh, uh, panel today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our speakers and I'm going to introduce our, our topic. Our speakers are Professors uh, Nicola Lacetera, Ignazio Marino, and Alvin Roth. Unfortunately, Professor Cinzia Caporale was supposed to be with us. She couldn't join us due to some unforeseen uh, events, and we wish her well. Um, so Nicola Lacetera is Associate Professor of Economics and Management at the University of Toronto in Canada. His research interests include the economics of innovation, experimental economics, and the role of psychology and ethics in influencing decision-making. Related to today's uh, topic, uh, Nicola and myself and other co-authors have done quite a bit of work uh, trying to understand the role of incentives uh, in the, the context of blood donation. We're also studying attitudes and preferences uh, of people towards morally contentious transactions. Well, we all know uh, Ignazio Marino. Uh, professor Marino is currently a professor of surgery at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas, uh, the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where he's also a strategic advisor to the president and the CEO of that uh, university. Professor Marino is a transplant surgeon. Um, in 1992-1993, he was a member of the team that, that performed the first uh, transplant, uh, liver transplant uh, from a baboon to a human being, uh, the first tra such transplant in the history of medicine. In 2001, he performed the first organ transplant in Italy on an HIV-positive uh, person. He is uh, uh, very interested and very passionate about civil rights, including uh, end-of-life issues uh, and ethical questions about transplants and, in particular, organ, uh, organ trafficking. And uh, Professor uh, Alvin Roth, you might have seen him uh, at his talk yesterday and at his uh, book presentation today. His book has just been uh, translated into Italian. It's called Matchmaking, La Scienza Economica di Dare a Ciascuno il Suo. Um, he's a professor of economics at Stanford University, and he received in 2012 the Nobel Prize in, uh, uh, in economics. Uh, of course, Professor Roth has a number of contributions in, in economics, in game theory, experimental economics, market design. Most relevant for today's conversation, he studies morally repugnant transactions, uh, and he has helped create the uh, kidney exchange program in the U.S. and in other countries, which is a system that has helped to increase substantially the number of kidney transplants being performed. Uh, so the topic uh, uh, of today's conversation is markets for body parts. So some of you, or many of you perhaps, are wondering why even think about introducing prices and economic transactions in the context of blood, plasma, and, and organs. Only cold, calculating economists could possibly think of uh, uh, consider, even consider you know, introducing prices in such contexts. So why? What is the reason? So the reason is that blood and plasma transfusions and organ transplants are often necessary to save uh, uh, lives. And economists are interested in them because these resources are, resources are often scarce. Um, so we're not just, and, and, and of course, you know, studying you know, how to allocate uh, scarce resources is central to economics. And we're not just talking about blood transfusions needed in case of accidents or traumas. There are many diseases, many types of cancer, cancers, leukemia, anemia, that require patients to receive periodic transfusions of blood or plasma uh, or, or to, to receive drugs derived from, uh, from plasma. Uh, and often an organ transplant uh, is the only option of, for survival for many patients. For example, in Italy, about 9,000 patients are on the waiting list for an organ. Of these, almost 7,000 have kidney disease, and so they're waiting for a kidney. In 2016, uh, fewer than 2,000 kidney transplants were performed in Italy. 
uh, we have a shortage of, of kidneys uh, in, in, in Italy, and, and that is also the case in many other countries. Almost 500 patients dropped out of the waiting list in, tw in 2016 without receiving a transplant, either because they died or because they became too sick to receive the uh, uh, transplant. In the United States, of course, the numbers are even bigger. 100,000 people are currently waiting for a kidney, and several thousands of people die every, every year. So the demand for kidneys exceeds supply. There's a shortage of organs for transplant. This has large human costs and also financial costs. The alternative to a kidney transplant, dialysis, is expensive and also unpleasant, leading to reduced quality of life and also reduced life expectancy for pa patients compared to receiving a, a transplant. Uh, each transplant saves the American healthcare system about $200,000, uh, and this doesn't even include you know, the uh, you know, improved life expectancy and, and quality uh, of life. Including those quantities would lead to uh, about one million dollars in, uh, in gains uh, from each additional transplant. So when economists observe a shortage in, in, in a market, they typically suspect that something's wrong with the price. The price is too low, otherwise supply would be higher. In the case of organs, the price is set to zero because it is illegal uh, to pay money uh, to kidney donors or other, other organ donors in all countries around the world, with only one exception, Iran. And later uh, today, we will have an opportunity to briefly talk about the Iranian uh, system. So patients who are waiting for a kidney or other organs, they must rely on altruistic donors. Altruism is, of course, wonderful. The, the problem is that altruism doesn't uh, appear to be enough. So providing monetary payments to donors or other forms of compensation can contribute to increasing supply, saving lives, and saving uh, costs to the healthcare uh, sector. So why not allowing the price mechanism to, to do the job? We rely, after all, we rely on markets uh, a lot in our, in our society to allocate many types of resources. However, the fact that payments are essentially universally prohibited indicates that the opposition to such payments is strong. So what are the sources of this opposition? What are the concerns associated with payments for organs and other controversial transactions? Should we use, can we use economic incentives in this context? These are some of the questions that we will explore with our uh, speakers today. So the goal is not to provide a final, final answer to, to these questions. The goal is more modestly, but importantly, we believe to provide elements for discussion and elements that will enrich our thinking about these, uh, these issues. So I would like to uh, uh, begin with Professor Marino. Um, you have you know, you've been a transplant surgeon for most of your professional life, um, and um, so you, you, your perspective is, we're very interested in, in your perspective. You've also been, uh, of course, you know, um, uh, able to influence or attempt to influence uh, policy in this, in this domain. So we're very interested in your perspective on, on this issue. So Professor uh, Marino uh, will, uh, um, before he begins uh, to talk, he would like to show a video to the, to the audience. So I'd like to ask our... Um... Every year, thousands of organs are bought and sold on a flourishing black market with a single organ selling for up to $200,000. Some might consider that a small price to pay if it's about saving your own life, but it's a complicated life and death business with legal, moral and ethical issues involved. They are the subject of a documentary called Tales from the Organ Trade, which tackles the problem from all points of view. I sat down with the film's director... effectively have to decide at this point whether, you know, if I can't find a donor in this country fairly soon, I have to decide whether I'm willing to take on my soul the ethical burden of purchasing a kidney from somebody or choose to die. 
Diseases like diabetes are increasing across the Western world, and the desperate need for kidneys leaves many patients struggling with difficult decisions, as depicted in the documentary, to live with the painful and time-consuming process of dialysis. You can't stay on this machine forever. It doesn't do what a kidney does. This is it, unless somebody offers me a kidney or unless uh, a cadaver becomes available. This is what keeps me alive. In Quezon province in the Philippines, organ cells are common amongst the male population. The documentary found many of them have no follow-up health care. And the other one is easy. Ayos lang po sa akin yun. At least nakatulong po ako sa kapwa ko. May lumalapit po po. Sa ngayon, dahil sa pangangailangan nga nung pera. But for others with undetected kidney disease and other illnesses, donating can be a death sentence. Based on the ultrasound findings, the left kidney has a mild renal disease. And this is a sign of a deteriorating left kidney. There is really a problem. He will be a candidate for dialysis, and he himself will be looking for a donor. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to Professor Machis for his uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, as he stated, I've been, uh, for most of my life, uh, a transplant surgeon, and um, therefore, uh, you know, I really believe that transplantation is a terrific uh, achievement in healthcare, and uh, through transplantation we can uh, not survive but uh, get back to a normal quality of life. There are people that, you know, do incredible things in their life after being saved through an organ transplant. A transplantation is actually in medicine relatively new because uh, as uh, uh, yesterday uh, Professor Roth showed to us uh, the first uh, um, successful kidney transplantation happened uh, only one year before I was born, happened in 1954. So compared to, uh, you know, other things in medicine uh, is uh, a completely new branch and um, has been incredibly uh, successful uh, in, a very, in very few years. It was not like that at the beginning. At the beginning, most of the people were dying uh, after a transplant, but nowadays the success rate, the organ survival, for example, for a kidney at one year is uh, close to 98, 99%. So, you know, going from 0% to 99% uh, in a matter of a few decades uh, is something that is not very common uh, in, uh, in uh, medicine and in surgery. On the other hand, uh, it has been victim of his own success. As uh, Professor Machis uh, did say before, as we speak here, comfortably sitting in this nice room, there are 100,000 people uh, waiting for an organ transplant in the United States of America, and about the same number of people in our continent, in Europe, 9,000 only in uh, Italy. And only you know, by the end of 2017, only 15%, more or less, of these people will get an organ. And uh, the other people will continue to wait, and many of them will die awaiting for an organ. Actually, I can tell you that as a transplant surgeon, the single question that any patient asks you after you see him the first time, every time you see him, the first question is, when I will have my organ. When will I get a kidney? When I will get a liver? And, uh, you know, therefore, um, because of that, uh, and because we live in a society where we are used to buy and sell whatever we need in our life, 
a market that is obviously an illegal market uh, developed uh, in the last uh, uh, few decades uh, in many countries in the planet and uh, uh, basically you know people uh, go in other countries and uh, try to get uh, a kidney most of the time is a kidney donor because obviously we have two kidneys and um, uh, and I believe so I start uh, you know the, our discussion with a, a strong statement that, uh, you know, exploiting the life of somebody else that is uh, poor because does not have uh, enough money to, you know, to give food to their children or enough money to have a decent life and uh, buy his or her kidney for $800, $900. And, you know, all the organization surrounding uh, this event will make $100,000, $200,000. I think that uh, is really not uh, a moral action. I think that is a crime because, uh, obviously, I don't think that we ever heard about somebody that has an income of $500,000 per year that is selling a kidney to uh, somebody, while we hear about people that are desperate and are selling uh, uh, their kidneys. And there are things that are even worse than this because, uh, uh, you know, for many years in a, con in a country, in a specific country, China, um, the, the many, the most of the organs used for transplantation uh, were harvested from people that were killed because uh, they were executed uh, prisoners, prisoners that uh, had a death sentence, and they were killed with a bullet uh, in the back of their head, and they moved fastly to an operating, uh, a mobile operating room, the organ harvested, and it's not fiction, this uh, happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and uh, if you check on Google, uh, you can see that people could actually schedule when to get a heart transplant because uh, the people in China uh, would uh, match you with a perfect donor that uh, was a prisoner and they, you know, decide on which day they execute that prisoner to get the heart or the liver and they sell to this foreign patient uh, that organ and the operation for saving 70 or 80,000 uh, 80, dollars. I think, uh, you know, though that this is a a issue that uh, uh, I, I spoke about is stream, but uh, what I would like to discuss uh, today, and hopefully, you know, even if Professor Maggi say that uh, we cannot uh, get to a conclusion or something, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it will be nice to understand what uh, we think about uh, uh, maybe not giving money, which, as I said, I consider a crime to, uh, you know, to, to buy an organ from a human being, but maybe to remove uh, some of the uh, disincentive in uh, donating an organ. Uh, and uh, my question to the other panelists here is, uh, what uh, do we think about uh, um, a situation where, for example, not an individual, but the state, uh, you know, pays for the funeral of somebody and, uh, you know, in, in exchange, uh, the family donates the organs that anyhow are going to be buried with a cadaver uh, to the society. So not to an individual, not to a single person, but to the sickest on the transplant waiting list. Is this, uh, wrong uh, or this is something that we could uh, possibly uh, consider and um, you know and the other thing is the thing that uh, made uh, one of the thing obviously amongst many things that made uh, Alvin Roth uh, famous in the transplant community is uh, you know starting a chain and I will try to explain with my words um, it, within our planet you know, for example, if I uh, am a, a very good friend of uh, Alvin and he needs uh, a kidney and I, because uh, of uh, emotional relationship, I decide to give my kidney, but I 
cannot give my kidney because I have a different blood type, so he cannot get my kidney. Somebody, somebody in some other part of the planet is in the same situation with a different blood type. Isn't that good um, to try to uh, fund a system that that person may be from a country where he cannot have any access to any treatment, so he will die. And we are not talking about fantasy, because as we speak, some, something in between of uh, two to seven million people every year die because they have no access to dialysis, no access to transplant. So maybe a country that has more money can, you know, help the patient that has an insurance or has the national health system that is supporting the transplant and at the same time, you know, performing the transplant with the other patient that is coming from a country where he has no access to any kind of treatment. And I believe that there is a, this is a really a win-win situation because, you know, somebody that will not have access to treatment will actually have access to treatment. And, you know, our country, where we have a national health system, we pay about... $100,000, 100,000 euro per year for a dialysis treatment. If that patient gets a, a kidney, next year we will cost to the society only $15,000. But there is even more than that because the patient, you know, think about somebody that is going to dialysis three times a week and they will have very, very little strength to do to do much in his life, instead he's going to be back a productive member of the society. And, uh, you know, uh, so the, so the, the state, the healthcare system will save money, the person will get to a, back to a normal life, and somebody else in another country will, has a ch will have a chance to uh, a good life that uh, obviously before he did not have because there is no treatment, no money for dialysis, no money and no uh, equipment for uh, transplantation. So I guess, uh, you know, I just wanted to make this short introduction. I think then we will get to other questions by, you know, seeing what we consider uh, moral, what we consider immoral, what we think we could do in such a difficult issue like, uh, you know, consider organ as a, you know, thing that we can use to save a life, but at the same time, you, we should not probably consider them as, uh, uh, you know, something that we can buy or sell because uh, otherwise we are going to exploit, uh, you know, the life of people that are poor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Marino. So, Professor Roth, of course, you're welcome to address the question that Professor Marino posed, but I would like you to tell the audience uh, something specific. You've been a pioneer in many areas in economics. In one, one in particular, you've been the first to point out to economists that we need to take moral repugnance seriously if we want to understand why many societies do not allow uh, pr the price mechanism to operate in certain contexts. So the case of human organs for transplantation is very interesting, be both because of its human and social implications, but also because societies are banning the sale of a good whose supply we actually wish to support and, and encourage, um, you know, giving an organ to somebody who would otherwise die. So um, what is moral repugnance and how is it that it influences what types of transactions society is allowed to take place? Well, my, uh, my first paper on, on repugnant transactions was called Repugnance as a Constraint on Markets. And I'm a market designer. I try to make things work better, I, you know, to improve welfare. Uh, but of course, sometimes, Economists can have ideas of improving welfare, and, and pe other people will say to them, you know, professor, maybe that's not such a good idea. And so uh, certainly the buying and selling of kidneys is illegal just about everywhere in the world. And whatever your opinion is on whether kidneys should be 
bought and sold and whether donors should be compensated. When you see something that's against the law everywhere in the world, you have to be a little impressed by that and think that whether you think those are good laws or bad laws, they might be hard to change. Because when something is against the law everywhere, there, there's probably powerful forces in motion. And so we started kidney exchange as a, a way of increasing the supply of kidneys without engaging in monetary payments. But let me try to put the question of repugnant transactions in a little bit of a broader context. For hundreds of years in the Middle Ages, it was considered repugnant to charge interest on loans in Europe. Now, today, with some exceptions in Islamic jurisprudence, we are mostly pretty comfortable with the idea that, that we can charge interest on loans. And it would be hard to imagine our global capitalist economy if we didn't have a market for capital. So, so sometimes old repugnances fade. But also, I, I spoke earlier today about my book, sometimes things that were not so repugnant in the past become repugnant. In the United States, we used to have markets for slaves. We don't anymore. Um, so aside from kidneys and organs for transplant, you might want to think about the different repugnances in different parts of the world for, for other transactions. For instance, one that has been, um, well, s some related transactions that have been uh, cause of current controversy here in Italy are same-sex marriage and surrogacy, which fit together a little bit because uh, same-sex couples, particularly male couples, don't have a womb between them, and so if they want to have children, they have to find some, some other arrangement. And in California, where I live, surrogacy is perfectly legal. You can pay surrogates, you can sign a contract that will engage a surrogate and will have your name on the California birth certificate as the parent. Here in Italy, that's not the case at all. Incidentally, in the United States, we also have same-sex marriage in all states now. Only for the last two years, it was a long, difficult process, a political and legal and legislative process. Uh, in Italy, surrogacy is not legal, but recently here in Trento, a court allowed uh, a, couple t uh, a male couple to adopt the child who they had had uh, through surrogacy in Canada. Whereas not long before, a court elsewhere in Italy seized a child from a couple that came back from Russia with, with a, a surrogate baby and put it up for adoption. And the European Court of Human Rights you know, ratified that decision. So surrogacy, in a way, is also selling of body parts, right? It's renting a womb. And in California, which is a very civilized part of the world, we have very different rules about that than you do here in Italy. So, so partly we can learn from the experience of places that do different things to find out what are the consequences, whether terrible things happen or good things. Let me also just partly remarking uh, to Ignacio's uh, story uh, about black markets. Black markets are run by criminals and by and large you have to be a pretty desperate person to, to engage in a market run by criminals because they are criminals. They might not do what they have promised for you. They might, you and they will be outside the law. We can have a good discussion of whether and if so how donors might be compensated or disincentives might be removed as, as Ignacio began to, to explore uh, without having to think that they would look like illegal black markets. You know, again, I live in, well, in the United States, from the late 1920s to the early 1930s, we had a constitutional amendment against the sale of alcohol. It was called prohibition. And it gave rise to organized crime and illegal uh, bootleg whiskey. But today, since the early 1930s, it's again been legal to sell alcohol in the United States. And today you can go into a wine store and buy wonderful Italian wines in the United States, which is a good thing by itself. And it also limits some of the bad things that happened when only criminals could sell alcohol. So I think that as we speak about whether and how uh, incentives, even monetary incentives, might be used for, for body parts, we should keep in mind that if we 
wanted to go in this direction, we would have to design ethical, safe markets that would allow us to increase the supply of kidneys, of blood, of blood plasma. Um, and and they, we would want to prevent them from being black markets. And in fact, there are two ways to try to prevent illegal transactions. One is to increase the police enforcement and the penalties and the, the, the war on drugs, for example. And another is to allow legal markets to compete with the illegal markets. So in the United States, we are presently seeing some shift state by state in whether it is illegal to buy and sell marijuana. In many states, it's now, in the United States, it's now legal to, to consume marijuana for medical purposes. And in a growing number of states, in Colorado and Washington and Oregon, it's, it becomes legal to consume marijuana for recreational purposes. Now, marijuana is, like, is regulated like alcohol in these places. Uh, it has good and bad consequences to, to have legal marijuana, but we were never able to eliminate the illegal market for marijuana, just as we are not able to eliminate the illegal market for heroin, which I think everyone agrees is never good for anyone. Um, but in the United States, the war against drugs has filled our prisons. This is not a good thing either. So laws against and regulated markets for both come with trade-offs, and it's the job of economists to think about trade-offs. Thank you, Professor. Ross. I just want to add one detail to what uh, um, brilliantly Alvin Roth said, and that uh, you know our society, any society, Italy, United States, any country you know in Europe, we actually pretend that we do not see uh, what is happening. And uh, why I'm making such a strong statement? Because. Uh, uh, think about a physician in our uh, uh, National Health Service or a physician in the uh, United States. Does it make any difference that we have uh, you know, a public uh, health service or an insurance-based health service? You have a patient that um, up to a month ago uh, came to you as a physician and you were following him um, through dialysis and then all of a sudden goes to the general practitioner and doesn't need you know help to go to dialysis but need a prescription for immunosuppression because all of a sudden has a new organ and does not have a medical record from a hospital where he got the organ so you know these things happen every day in front of our eyes and we just uh, pretend that we don't see them thank you um, I to now turn to Professor Lacetera. Um, so among the objections uh, put forward by opponents of economic incentives or payments to organ donors, two objections have been particularly influential in, in the policy debate and for actual policy making. The first is that introducing payments for an activity that people already perform, even in the absence of payments, out of altruism, um, so out of a desire to help others, that introducing incentives in these contexts might reduce people's intrinsic motivation to do so. And so intrinsic motivation is the satisfaction that people derive uh, simply from uh, you know, performing a certain, a certain action, from helping others in this, in this case. And so uh, through this mechanism, the, obje the objection is that introducing incentives might actually reduce donations rather than increase donations. The second objection is that uh, the promise of a payment might attract the wrong kind of donor. Uh, for example, in the context of blood donation, the concern is that uh, monetary payments might induce individuals who are more likely to have infectious diseases, for example, to give blood, and, and therefore the, 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 the incentives could jeopardize the safety of the blood supply. Now, these are, of course, hypotheses that in principle can be empirically tested. Uh, so what is the empirical evidence on this and how real is the concern that uh, incentives reduce intrinsic motivation and that uh, jeopardize the safety of blood supply and other oh, su 
So yeah, we, we started to look at this problem, uh, especially with the focus on the donation of blood and uh, blood components uh, with, uh, with Mario and other co-authors. Uh, and we realized that the debate had been going on for a long time, since the early, since the early 70s, and, uh, but there wasn't really satisfactory empirical evidence. There weren't good data telling us, do rewarding donors in some way uh, does rewarding donor in some way actually uh, increase or decrease uh, supply of blood, or maybe it doesn't have any, any, impact, uh, any impact whatsoever, and so it's just a cause that we might want to avoid. Uh, and so we set out to perform a number of studies, collecting data uh, from different countries, uh, both retrospective data and also data from randomized trials that uh, we run uh, in Argentina, in the U.S. mostly, in Italy uh, as well. And even from these very different contexts and with partially different methodologies, actually we got very sort of consistent uh, results that the different incentives, the different rewards uh, uh, that the donor received actually helped in increasing supply, uh, increasing the amount of blood that was uh, available without any consequences on what we can call the quality of blood infections or uh, the percentage of people who are ineligible to donate because of their health history uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, so, in a sense, uh, we didn't mean to uh, sort of settle the debate, science always uh, evolves, but we've, you know, we've, we thought that we'd at least uh, channeled the debate in the right, uh, uh, in the right place you know, asking the question, do incentives work? If they work, well, let's implement some of these incentives. Uh, things didn't go uh, so easy in some way we got, because we got quite a bit of pushback from various agencies like the WHO, the World Health Organization, and others. And what they were criticizing us for was, was actually quite interesting. So they weren't criticizing the results or the quality of the methods they were using. They were essentially saying, we believe your results. We believe what you found that providing some incentives will uh, actually increase supply. We just, we just don't like it. We don't like the idea of it. And so in a sense, they were telling us we kind of prefer a system where we have less blood available for uh, transfusion, but we don't give any compensation to, um, uh, to donors. Uh, and so that's, what, that's why we sort of got interested in the idea that maybe it's not just about providing evidence, but it's to a large extent about understanding the social support or the level of moral repugnance uh, toward certain markets, certain transactions when they include some form of uh, compensation. And that's how we got to know uh, Al's work on uh, um, repugnant transactions. And we wanted, again, to apply empirical methodology, methodology to understand are actually uh, people, uh, are people really uh, sort of uh, concerned about the moral issues uh, around paying for blood and for organs uh, as well? And what are the concerns uh, that people have? And so some of the studies we, we, recently, uh, we recently run asked exactly this question. And what we found is actually people have some ethical concerns. So by serving uh, uh, a, few thousand, a few thousand individuals in the U.S., it turns out that if you ask them what do you think essentially about uh, a system that includes payment, they do consider it more coercive uh, than a system without payment, so they have a sense that maybe people are making the choice to donate when there is money uh, on the table, uh, not really freely, they're not doing it completely willingly. Uh, they, they have concern about the fairness of these transactions and also concern about the fact that the human body shouldn't have a price. So there is uh, a degradation, of a, in a sense, of, uh, um, of the human body, of human dignity. However, it turns out that payment per se, uh, the presence of a payment, is not what really concerns people. And here I come to what uh, Ignazio was saying a minute ago uh, about proposal, various proposals. So if the payment comes from a third party, say, the government, uh, the public sector, and not from the recipient, so it's not the, a system of individual transactions, that people are actually much more comfortable with the idea of providing payments uh, because they consider that this is a fairer system 
as opposed to a system of individual transactions where essentially those who have more means, are richer, have more possibilities to find, uh, to find the kidney, maybe at the expense of a poorer, uh, of a poorer person. So people, uh, sort of their concerns are allayed by the fact that the third party provide equal opportunities to, uh, to everybody, and they are willing to consider this uh, system with payments as long as at least hypothetically, we couldn't test this because you know, paying is illegal, uh, uh, but at least hypothetically, people are willing to consider, are willing to support a system that includes uh, payment if that uh, increased, uh, increased supply. So what we derive from this is that yes, uh, moral issues are uh, an essential part uh, of the picture of understanding how we can increase uh, supply, but these values, these moral values that people consider are not entirely sacred. They're not values that people are not willing to compromise against anything. In front of a significant increase in the supply, for example, of kidneys, people are willing to consider the idea of, uh, of a payment. I also wanted to connect to another thing that Ignazio said that I found extremely uh, sort of inspiring and interesting. He was saying, you know, one question you are asked by a patient is, when will I get my kidney, right? Um, um, was it one or two years ago, I don't even remember now, we had a symposium at Johns Hopkins University, Al and Mario were there, and Dr. Arthur Matas uh, was there, he's a transplant surgeon. And so he said, yes, that's one question, he said exactly the same thing, he said, that's the first question you are, you are asked, and there is one thing you don't wanna tell people, and it is, we don't have any kidney for you, sorry. And he, he was initially, in his career, very opposed to the idea of any form of compensation, but he came to the point of saying, I am tired of telling people we don't have a kidney for you. I can't do it anymore. It's, it's really too much. We need to do something. And it seems very much in line with what the larger uh, sample, about 3,000 people in our, in our survey were saying, essentially, in front of some significant increase in supply, well, let's, let's think about it, uh, at least. And so that's where we are. Uh, at least my knowledge with the evidence about, about these issues uh, to date. Thank you, uh, Nico. Uh, so I... Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I would like, I mean, this is already sort of conversation taking the shape, uh, sh the shape that I was hoping, meaning that uh, I was hoping that this could generate some conversation and debate between our speakers, and so I'd like to invite them to ask each other, uh, you know, questions. Uh, Al, would you like to start? Okay, well, we, we discussed some of our questions before, so, so I thought I have a, a question for Ignazio. Um, som incidentally, sometimes people's ideas about what's a bad idea or a good idea when it comes to things like selling body parts. Sometimes people have very strong opinions. They think that not only are some things bad ideas, they're the kind of bad ideas that only bad people have. And recently Ignazio was at a meeting of the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the Vatican's Academy of Sciences, that, that was a very interesting meeting. It, it spoke about organ transplantation and included a delegation from China, which, as Ignazio mentioned, is a uh, a tough country for transplants. And they issued a statement which said that three things were crimes against humanity. Now that's language that, that is Nuremberg language. Crimes against humanity we normally think of as war crimes, World War II. And they said three things are crimes against humanity. One is killing prisoners for their organs. Another is compensating living donors, voluntary donors. And a third is compensating the families of deceased donors. And my question to Ignazio is, of these three things, it seems to me that one is different from the others. Well, uh, um, I agree with uh, the conclusion uh, of uh, Professor Roth, but let me explain a little bit uh, uh, about uh, the meeting that uh, he described to you. This meeting was uh, arranged, as he said, by the Pontifical Academy of Science, uh, which is, a, you know, is an academy that has been there for a number of years. It's the academy that uh, brought to trial Galileo Galilei. So, you know, and uh, so the, 
and um, you know thanks god nowadays you know they 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 do not have the same kind of procedures otherwise uh, <laughs> most of us uh, will uh, <laughs> will not end uh, in a nice uh, in a nice way uh, but um, jokes aside uh, it, you know there was a, a more than a discussion actually there was there were arguments about uh, uh, this meeting and uh, you know arranging this meeting and inviting people at this uh, meeting we were about uh, 60 people uh, mostly transplant surgeon or transplant physicians and the critical question was uh, is it right or is it wrong to invite uh, the people that are performing uh, transplantation in China using organs uh, coming from executed prisoners. And I, I have to be honest with you, I was uh, you know, not very much in favor of uh, inviting them, and maybe I, I was wrong, I don't know. I think everybody needs to develop his own judgment on that because uh, you know, the, the idea was uh, exclude them from a, a public debate and a public community where to discuss uh, you know what is right and what is wrong or include them and you know maybe establish new rules and uh, you know um, in a way uh, push them uh, to uh, obey to these kind of uh, rules that we think are right and not to their to their system so um, the first day actually was really, I was, as I was uh, telling Al before, was really tough because, uh, you know, nobody was addressing this issue directly. And at a certain point, uh, you know, I say, look, uh, you know, the question, and I had uh, just in front of me, Wang Yefu is uh, the most important uh, transplant uh, surgeon in China, and he probably transplanted thousands of organs uh, that came for prisoners that were killed. And I said, you know, the, the bottom line uh, at the end of the day is this. Uh, is it right or wrong that somebody that, uh, you know, is um, in Italy or in the United States or France, uh, and uh, as we have seen uh, on that uh, video before, is living uh, uh, because uh, of uh, dialysis, or maybe has uh, a cirrhotic liver or, uh, you know, a failing heart. And it is right or wrong, uh, uh, you know, for, the, for this person that has, uh, you know, the amount of money that is needed uh, to go and uh, on Google to connect with people in China, send his medical records, uh, and uh, you know get back uh, a notice that he needs to travel, uh, you know, on uh, um, August 15 because the following week they will have uh, a heart donor with a perfect match, and it will cost uh, seventy thousand uh, dollars to him. I mean, if they can schedule uh, a, a perfect match for the week of August 15, that means that they will kill somebody the week of August 15. And so, you know, the, the discussion developed and at the beginning was not uh, uh, that nice because the people from China, uh, you know, declared themselves uh, offended uh, because uh, they said that, you know, these people, this is their law and, um, you know, is the... Uh, Republic of China, they have that sentence as uh, it exists in the United States uh, of uh, America. And the difference is that in the United States of America, they kill people with that sentence, but they don't save people with their organs. And they, they say also that they were spontaneously donated because uh, the prisoner would sign, you know, a donation act, but uh, before getting killed. But uh, I don't think he agreed on getting killed, uh, you know, he, he just signed the donation act uh, before, but uh, I don't consider that a free uh, uh, donation, donation act. And so, to answer uh, to, the, to the important question of Al, why three different things like that were put together? Because they, you know, insisted in having everything put together in order to accept uh, 
to call what they were doing a crime against uh, against the humanity and um, you know maybe it just uh, doesn't mean much but uh, we got all got the participant to that meeting uh, Last week, we all got uh, an email from uh, some physicians uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, and this group of physicians uh, wrote to us that uh, for the first time ever in the last uh, three months, uh, they didn't get any, as I was saying before, you know, if you get an organ in, 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 and you do not have medical records, uh, uh, no matter what, you need to go to your physician to get the immunosuppression because you need the anti-rejection drugs. And this physician in Singapore said that for the first time ever, uh, they didn't mm, have anybody coming back from China with a new organ uh, asking for uh, anti-rejection drugs. So maybe they stopped, but so far mm, they did not accept any random inspection uh, to their hospital. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's difficult to say if they really uh, stop to use the organs of uh, uh, killed prisoners because uh, uh, they did not accept uh, for people from other countries to go and see what they are doing in their hospital. Um, I do really think that uh, is uh, really bad and that we need, uh, uh, you know, to fight these things because uh, um, I may be considered extreme, but I think is, uh, I do think is a crime, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it's something that uh, should not be performed. Uh, if you uh, are on dialysis, uh, um, obviously uh, is right for you to hope to have an organ and to get back to a normal life, but uh, I don't think that uh, just because you have the money to do so, you can, uh, you know, just say, okay, who cares uh, if somebody gets killed and uh, I get the organ, uh, you know, I go back to a normal life and uh, next year instead of buying a new BMW, I just buy a new heart. I think that is wrong. So I, I, I had a question for, uh, for Al. Uh, so yesterday in your lecture, um, you told us a lot about uh, kidney exchanges and kidney chains and how they have helped uh, enhance the supply, uh, supply of kidneys, most in the U.S., but now also in other countries, including Italy. And, uh, and you, as well as Tito Boer, in introducing your lecture, really stressed how, you know, this is, uh, you know, a great application of... Um, economic theory and market design in trying to increase efficiency, so in this case in, in increasing the supply of kidney, in a way that is uh, socially and ethically uh, acceptable. Um, and so, I mean, uh, this is an incredibly important progress, uh, uh, both in economics and in healthcare. Uh, but in a sense, this solution is, is very specific, right? It's specific to the fact that we have two kidneys, we can give one away while being uh, alive and live, uh, uh, live well in general with, uh, with the other. It has to do with the fact that there are compatibility issues uh, and so on. So it's a very targeted uh, 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 solution. So my, my, my question is, can we think of the use of the tools of market design to improve the efficiency of other of these, you know, ethically uh, controversial markets? You were mentioning surrogacy uh, earlier on, thinking about in vitro fertilization, but also medically assisted uh, dying, which is an issue that also in Italy has been discussed uh, lately. So can we think of market design solution to improve the efficiency of these markets while at the same time uh, limiting as much as possible the moral concerns and increasing the social support for, for these for this, uh, well, transactions? That, that, that's a good question, and I, I think that the tools of market design might be very useful for thinking about how to construct legal, ethically acceptable markets. Uh, and, and part of the questions that you have to ask is, what is it that we find so repugnant right. about the black markets that, that we see. Incidentally, there are some markets that we successfully ban. There are not black markets. For instance, if you wanted to murder someone, probably you couldn't hire someone 
to do it for you. There, there may be people who can do this, but often they rely on employees. Uh, there's not a spot market because we pretty successfully have, through the legal process, made sure that there's not a, a, a thick market for, for murderers. But we're not nearly as successful at eliminating the market for heroin, for example, or cocaine. And so sometime when we, when we uh, make laws against markets, we are already doing market design. We are designing the black market that will take the place of the legal markets. And we might prefer to have legal markets that, that mitigated some of the, the harms that black markets can cause. So, for example, one reason why, why many people find markets for kidneys repugnant is we wouldn't like the idea that only rich people could have kidney transplants and only poor people would, would sell their kidneys. Uh, but as Ignacio mentioned, when he talked about uh, perhaps paying the funeral expenses for deceased donors, it doesn't have to be rich people buying kidneys this way. It could be the, the state, you know, one, one buyer uh, helping deceased donation to happen and then, and then distributing the organs the way we do now, but just having more organs. Uh, so that's a, a case of a market design that, that Ignacio proposed in his comments that I think would address some of the concerns we have that it would give rich people unfair advantages in the matter of organs. Um, these questions, the, the question of will a market successfully overcome repugnance and become a socially supported market is a, a tough one to know the answer to. When I was young, the United States was engaged in the Vietnam War and we had a conscription army. The way we recruited soldiers was by, by saying to them, Uncle Sam wants you, and, and you had to, to be a soldier. But when the war ended, we had a big public political debate about whether we should move, whether we should abolish conscription and move to what we call a volunteer army, which is to say we would start to pay soldiers. It would be a, a job. And one of the concerns that was expressed was that maybe this would be a repugnant transaction. Maybe American soldiers would become to, come to be seen as, as mercenaries. Now, we could have a long discussion about whether a conscription army or a volunteer army is a good thing or not, but certainly in the United States, soldiers have not come to be seen as mercenaries. When we line up for getting on a, an airplane, we, we line up behind serving soldiers, and when someone runs for the Senate, if he was a serving soldier, he is proud to, to speak about it. I served my country when I was young. Um, whereas other legal markets don't, don't have that uh, necessarily. In uh, many parts of Europe, in Germany, for example, prostitution is legal. But no one runs for German political office, for mayor of Bonn, uh, by saying, you should vote for me because when I was young, I was a sex worker. Uh, so, so the market has remained repugnant, even though legal. So I think the, the issues to address, the issues that market design would have to help us address, are both how to organize markets, especially in cases where we cannot prevent black markets, and how to organize them so that not only would they increase supply, but that they would be socially acceptable. On this matter, let me just add that the, the questions about market design are sometimes complicated by the fact that we reach different solutions in different jurisdictions. So, so Professor La Cetera spoke about uh, the market for blood. And in the United States, where I live, we, we get whole blood only from volunteer donors, but we get plasma, blood without the red blood cells and, and those things, we get those from paid donors. In Canada, our neighbor to the north, they think that it's a terrible idea to pay people for plasma, and so they get all of their whole blood and all of their plasma from volunteer donors. But this doesn't give them enough plasma, so they buy hundreds of millions of dollars of plasma products each year from the United States, where there's an abundant supply of plasma. And plasma is not just the plasma itself, it's medical products like interferon and, and, and such, which are valuable and save people's lives. And the United States is a big exporter of plasma products. So, uh, so our Canadian friends are able to adopt a, what they regard as a very highly ethical position of not paying for plasma, which they don't need to do because they can buy it from the United States. 
Thanks. I, <laughs> I have a follow-up question, uh, following up on some of what you uh, just said, and also to, to some of what the, um, uh, Ignazio and Nico uh, said earlier. Uh, there seems to be a strong opposition uh, towards, you know, individual transactions. In, you know, individuals uh, privately purchasing uh, kidneys. But uh, you know, in our work with Nico, we found that there is a lot less opposition to a system that uh, separates organ procurement from organ allocation. So with a, with a government uh, agency doing the procurement and so compensating the donors and then an agency again allocating organs according to some priority rules, perhaps similar to the rules currently adopted uh, to, to allocate uh, uh, organs from, uh, from cadavers. Um, um, so unfortunately, I mean unfortunately, we only have one example of a legal system of uh, 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 payments to kidney donors, which is the example of Iran. We were talking earlier, Professor Marino has just been in, in Iran, so I was wondering, could you share your, and the other panelists, of course, if you want to add something, share your take on what can we learn what, from the Iranian system of payments to uh, kidney donors? Well, what uh, Professor Machi is uh, uh, saying is that uh, Iran is the only country in our planet uh, where uh, you can actually legally uh, buy uh, a kidney from a live uh, donor. If uh, uh, you have been on the waiting list for a number of months and uh, no kidney became available for, uh, for a kidney transplant, you can um, you are encouraged by the government uh, to ask to some uh, family member uh, or friend to donate a kidney to you. And if you don't find anybody compatible uh, within your family or your friends, you can ask to other people. And the government put uh, a cap, uh, which is $900. And um, you can uh, buy for this amount of money a kidney for you know, somebody that uh, is, you know, somebody that you don't know that uh, is uh, um, ready to sell the kidney, his kidney to, to you. And um, we had a, a transplant meeting because Iran is becoming very successful with uh, organ transplantation uh, because uh, their religious leader uh, issued a fatwa uh, saying that uh, is a, a good thing to donate organs uh, after you die. So because of that, uh, the number of donations that were almost zero, uh, because in their culture the body uh, needs to be intact after the death, because of this uh, statement by their religious leaders, the donation after that went from zero uh, to 20 uh, donor per million, which is about the same that we have uh, in, uh, in Italy. And this happened in a matter of a few years. So right now, uh, you know, the number of uh, transaction uh, between people, uh, individuals that are buying and selling organs are decreasing because uh, the number of uh, organs uh, from uh, cadaveric donors is uh, actually increasing significantly. Uh, but when we addressed, uh, you know, we had a, a transplant meeting there, when we addressed this uh, topic, they, um, you know, they became a little bit upset because uh, uh, they consider that uh, like, uh, you know, um, common comments uh, by people that do not understand the, fully their society. And, uh, you know, they, had, uh, uh, they made the point that because of that, uh, because of this uh, um, rule that they have, you know, the waiting list for a kidney in uh, Iran is almost uh, uh, zero. And uh, one other detail that should be added, uh, the different from, uh, for example, from China, uh, you cannot uh, 
by a kidney unless you are from Iran. You know, you cannot, uh, uh, I cannot go to Iran and buy a kidney, get a kidney transplant. Only citizen of Iran can do that and the entire system is regulated. That does not happen with brokers or with the black market. It happens in the open and is regulated by the, by the state. And nevertheless, uh, you know, I consider that uh, really not good because, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, in Iran there is a big disparity between uh, very rich people and very poor people. And you don't really see very rich people selling a kidney for $900. So you see uh, very poor people selling a kidney for $900. And uh, again, I think that that is, uh, even if it has been regulated by the government, uh, is uh, is wrong. I have to be honest with you, and if you go on the British Medical Journal of 2001, I wrote a paper that was much more radical. I, I did write uh, that um, we exactly as the law says in the United States of America, uh, you, you cannot exchange anything of value for an organ. And um, I was really convinced about that. Nowadays, uh, I think that maybe if we have a system where not the individual, but the state, you know, uh, give something to, to the family of, this, of a deceased person and, uh, you know, maybe paying, uh, the, as I was saying before, the funeral expenses and the kidney or the, organ, or the other organs do not go to a specific person but go to the first person in need of that organ to the general transplant list of that country, uh, so there is not a, an individual transaction, maybe we should at least open the discussion and see what the peop people think about, uh, 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 about that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, and by the end of the day, I think uh, that this is a matter where, I, at least this, uh, I maybe Ten, day, ten years from now, I will change my opinion even on, the, on this. But, uh, you know, I, I do think that by the end of the day, it's not up to the physicians uh, to decide what is right and what is wrong, but is a matter that should be decided by the society at large. It's the society that needs to set the rules and decide what is good and what is uh, wrong, not the physician. <laughs> Okay, so we have until 7.45, so we do have a few minutes for questions from the audience. I would like oh to <laughs> ask that uh, you keep them short so we can maximize the number of questions in the time that we, that we have. No, there's a lady with the microphone. I just want to ask you, what about the artificial organs for transplanting? I, I know it's another subtopic, but it seems to me that could be the, the only solution. And, uh, uh, and the second thing is to, uh, to reply to what Professor Marino said is uh, up to society to, dis to debate. It's true. It's a very tough debate and uh, very difficult. But uh, personally, I think that the act of donating should go back to, um, to a sort of, uh, um, to a, a more awareness of people of, about what is going on when you, uh, when you have a new organs. So uh, uh, people just buy and sell things that, as, as in a supermarket, that is the, the problem, I think. And I wonder whether you said a third part a state uh, is uh, uh, managing this uh, uh, interaction between donators and uh, uh, offers. Uh, I wonder whether, I know it seems very utopical, but uh, if uh, uh, the person who receives an organ commits himself or herself uh, to dedicate uh, his new life, uh, her, her life, to society. I mean, it's something that we should start considering. It's a new life. It's, uh, uh, you can do 
considering the high numbers of donators, our world will change. Grazie. Well, um, the, 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 the issue of the artificial organ is actually a very, is becoming the last, uh, I, I do not have here the slides, but uh, I gave a presentation about that in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, it's really fascinating because uh, uh, technology nowadays uh, um, uh, is such that uh, uh, we can uh, use uh, uh, not a liver, but a heart and a, a kidney or a lung from a pig, and then you can inject in his vessel some, uh, you know, chemicals. The chemicals destroy all the cells that have uh, the immune system uh, target, and then you can inject new cells that are coming maybe from me or from you, so are self, you know, self cells, and uh, you can repopulate the organ, and actually they had... Uh, heart like that and kidney like that, uh, you know, transplanted from uh, a, a pig originally to a primate and actually they function. So, you know, is a, um, and, uh, and that uh, maybe um, Al knows that because is uh, uh, more in the field of economics than in the field of surgery. Uh, I have read that, uh, you know, a big company uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, raising uh, pigs uh, for food in the United States may cut a deal with a, a drug company because uh, when this n you know, uh, new technology became available, they think that maybe they can produce uh, uh, pigs uh, uh, for this purpose. So maybe uh, uh, it, that is not uh, uh, too far and we could have uh, artificial organs that obviously this will, uh, uh, will, uh, will be completely different, uh, will be a completely different game, but uh, is not available as, uh, as, uh, as of yet. About uh, the other thing that you have said, I think, uh, you know, um, maybe one thing that uh, uh, could work well, and, in, and uh, there have been discussion in the uh, transplant community and even uh, outside of the transplant community about this, is uh, how to, uh, you know, push people to be aware, as you were saying, about how good could be organ donation, and particularly, you know, after you are dead. I mean, uh, and, um, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, one system that uh, obviously is not an exchange of anything, so maybe, I don't know, I, I, I ask the help of the other three panelists uh, uh, to judge uh, this statement of mine. Maybe it's not illegal, even with the uh, law that we have at the present time in the United States and many other countries. If you give uh, priority, you know, like priority boarding on an airline, you give priority boarding for, uh, uh, you know, a kidney transplant to somebody that has a donor card. You know, if I have a donor, I wrote, uh, I, you know, I subscribed a donor card, so, and I am, um, and, uh, you know, so I, 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 I cut a deal with my country or wherever I will die that at the time of my death uh, all my organs uh, will be used, then uh, why shouldn't the society give me some advantage to somebody else that is not a donor? So if I will need a heart or I will need a kidney, I should go, ha sorry, Nicola, ahead of Nicola on the, on the transplant waiting list because Nicola is not, uh, did not sign a donor card. And I think that will make people think, you know, uh, there is something that I cannot buy that is invaluable, you know, the value is so high that I, there's no price, but if I will be generous enough, and that is not that generous, that I will donate my organs when I don't need their organs any longer because I'm dead, I will go on priority boarding. I think that will work. But let me just remark that since 2012, Israel has had such a priority law uh, for deceased donation. And there, too, market design is an issue. It may make perfect sense for Ignacio to go ahead of Nico, because uh, Nico didn't sign up in this hypothetical, but, but not against 
Nico's children who are, who are not able to sign up. So when you start giving people priority, you have to think, you have to design the system to make sure that, that the priorities work the way you want them to, that you shouldn't move, for example, children who are not registered donors to the back of the list. Yeah, um, thank you very much for an interesting discussion. And I'd like to bring it back to the issue that you mentioned several times today, from organ selling to organ renting. And um, these two markets seems to be conceptually different. And speaking econ in economic terms, leaving apart the whole ethical discussion apart because it deserves a, a separate panel itself. Um, these two markets are trying to uh, solve different problems. While in kidney exchange market, there is the, the supply sh uh, falls short on demand because there is a long waiting list and few people willing to donate those organs, and therefore introducing an incentive to um, w can help to um, find an equilibrium b between supply and uh, demand on the market. While their surrogate maternity, there, re there are a lot of uh, orphan children, and there are few people willing to adopt them. And still, there is so by introducing this surrogate uh, maternity or um, one branding, will increase the supply in the market where supply is already very high. So, how do you think a market design? Um, can help here, and uh, what are other differences between those markets? Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question. What kind of markets do you have in mind? Mm, uh, gestational surrogacy, I believe. So, well, so so surrogacy, you know, is it a market where where there's already a great supply? Obviously, many people can have their own children, but the mar the demand for surrogacy comes from people who cannot have their own children. Uh, so. Uh, so, sometimes it turns out people can have a great desire to have children. In Sweden, where surrogacy is illegal, womb transplantation has been initiated. They pioneered the transplant of wombs. So, so apparently the desire to have your own children can be very strong. There are, of course, black markets for surrogacy. There are many places where surrogacy is illegal, like Italy. Uh, but there's, there's fertility tourism, just as there's transplant tourism. So, um, I mean, there are, there are more dimensions to this than I can think about, but, but there are some markets that are simply hard to prevent. And one of the questions we face as a society is what should we do with markets that we may be uncomfortable about, but that we cannot prevent? Purtroppo il tempo a nostra disposizione è quasi scaduto anche contando due minuti di recupero. Unfortunately, uh, time is over, but this gentleman uh, uh, asks for the floor. You just promised to say three uh, things. My name is Father Celestino. I always take a floor at the festival. I'd like to thank, uh, give three thanks uh, uh, for this meeting. I'd like to thank... Uh, uh, the festival uh, to bring about new ideas. Then I would like to thank the speakers uh, who in, uh, indeed offer universal ideas, opening us up to, the, uh, to Europe and the, and the whole world. And then a third thank to the former mayor of uh, Rome, Ignazio Marino, who was brave enough to uh, in a way, uh, burn his career as a politician to chase for the mafia. So please uh, take this opportunity uh, to uh, put yourself at a test, uh, because we want peace in the world. A final conclusion. Uh, our uh, Nobel Prize told us that uh, the money uh, used by weapons should be used uh, for uh, health purposes. Uh, 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 I don't know whether you copied uh, Pope Francis or uh, Pope Francis copied you. Thank you. I also uh, would like to thank the speakers. Thank you to the audience. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, today's conversation. Thank you.